Well, good morning and welcome to the Carlisle Public Schools. It's a great honor to welcome uh, Governor Baker, Commissioner Riley, and Secretary Pizer this morning to come and view our school um, and see all the incredible work that our people have been doing. Um, it has been a concerted effort put forth by our faculty and staff, our administrative team, our students, our families, our school committee, um, town boards and officials, everyone has really leaned into the project of reopening our schools. And I think we've been able to make that possible for our students. And it's great to have folks at the state level come out and recognize all of that hard work. Um, I think I would also be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that yes, we are somewhat privileged here in Carlisle and we were well positioned to make this transition. But all that being considered, it has been an incredible amount of work on the part of everyone the entire community to make this possible. So the recognition is, is great and we just want to continue to thank our teachers and our staff who work tirelessly. The project isn't over, right? Every day is a, there's a new challenge, but our people continue to work as the folks across the Commonwealth. All educators are doing the same, working to keep their students in person, keep everyone safe and healthy and educated and moving forward. Um, I also want to just have the opportunity to have the microphone to thank uh, the Mass Association of School superintendents um, and the, the round tables they support and all the collaboration that takes place between districts and supporting one another and making sure that we all are in the best position possible to service our students and our communities. Um, so as stressful as this has been with the recent call for you guys to come out and see our school, we really appreciate it and we're just thankful that you recognize all the hard work and effort that educators across the Commonwealth are putting in to make this possible. So thank you. I want to thank Commissioner Riley for his leadership. Um, I know it's not an easy task. No one has been through this, and we all get frustrated at times with the way things are going, but we really appreciate the leadership provided by the DSC. And of course, Governor Baker, we appreciate your leadership, and we thank you for the support. And I'll be remiss, you know, I've heard it multiple times coming in the building just now, people are so uh, appreciative of your leadership over the Commonwealth during this time. So thank you, and thank you for the continued support. And of course, I'll talk to you later on about some additional funds we may need as uh, it's not inexpensive to open school during these times and these challenges. But thank you again. Thank you for all your support and welcome. It's my pleasure to have you. Thank you very much, Superintendent. Um, you know, the first of all, I just want to say uh, on behalf of uh, our team, um, Secretary Pizer and, and Commissioner Riley, uh, how much we appreciate your willingness to open up the door and, and give us a chance to disrupt a bit of what goes on here every day um, so that we can get a, a firsthand look at, at how you're handling um, in-person learning. And, and I, I guess I would say a couple things. The first is, um, while the state has developed lots of guidelines based on, and advisories, based on the best information that's out there, um, in the public domain. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, in many cases, it's going to be up to places like this to figure out how to fit those guidelines into the way business gets done in this particular school and in this particular school district. And there were a number of examples of how that played out as we were walking through here. And some of them are not things that would be obvious at first glance. For example, um, they did some really interesting work with their existing furniture, which looked more like a swap than anything else in terms of how they thought about distance in the cafeteria versus the classroom and how they were going to deal with um, creating distance for kids in the cafeteria using, in many cases, a lot of the desks that looked to me like you modified them a bit. Well, we bought new desks and we transferred the tables. Um, and scheduling. So they have four shifts for lunch, and, uh, and those shifts are organized. And some kids eat in class, and some kids eat in the cafeteria, depending upon how the shifts work. And I'm sure that um, that is a big change from the way things used to work. And the classrooms themselves, it's pretty obvious that you're using every single square inch of space that's available in those classrooms to create the kind of distance you want to create for the kids. And, and the other thing is, every kid, every child we saw as we wandered through there, was wearing a mask and didn't seem all that stressed about it, which makes them a lot more mature than many of the adults that I know. And, um, and I have to say that in one class, 
we spent a bunch of time talking about bats, um, not these, the ones that fly, which was um, terrific. And then in this most recent class, it was algebra. And I had a flashback to my own eighth grade experience as they posted the question up on the board, which was a word problem. Um, you know, the, the, <laughs> the store sells the first four batches of apples at a fixed price. If you buy 19 batches, you pay, was that the one you paid $33 for? No. Yeah, that was the one you, that was 11. Yeah, $55, $55 if you bought 19, $11, or, uh, $33 if you bought 11, and uh, what's the fixed price for the first four batches? And um, and I did exactly what I used to do when I was in school with a problem like that, was I stared at it. And uh, and then Brayley, Bradley, Brady. Brady. Brady got up there and he said, okay, you've got 55 in one case, 33 in the other, you subtract the two, that gives you 22. So that's the difference between in price between buying um, between buying 11 and buying 19. So then he said, that difference, that 22, divide that by the, the 8, which represents the difference between 19 and 11, and that'll give you the price of each incremental batch that you put. He's walking through this, and I'm like, I remember this. I was never the kid at the board, but I absolutely remember watching this play out time and time again, and it was just, for me anyway, a big reminder about why, um, why finding a way to get kids back in a classroom can be so powerful for them and for their classmates and for their instructors. And, um, and we've tried very hard as a state to provide people with a lot of guidance um, and resources, um, but we recognize and understand that the decision about the how is ultimately gonna get made at the local level because people know their districts best. And it's very clear to me that here, um, one of the things I always, I always talk about when you're dealing with changes is you need people who are willing to try. And it's very clear that here people are willing to try. And, and I don't think you're just trying here, uh, Superintendent, and it's good to have Dr. The, uh, the, two super, the two principals of the elementary school and the middle, middle school here with us as well. Um, it's very clear that you folks are not only trying, but you're getting it done, and it's terrific for us to have a chance to spend some time with you in a school been great and I really appreciate that um, I don't know if commissioner or secretary you want to add anything yeah. so um, you know the best part of our job I think my job anyway is to come back and see kids uh, learning and doing what they're supposed to and it just reminds us again how important it is for kids to be in school and I just want to thank everyone from the school committee members to the teachers, the administrators, and the community at large here who really work together to get a good operation in place for kids. So thank you. Questions? Can we go on topic first? I think the um, I think the superintendent roundtables are certainly, uh, which Jim mentioned, um, are absolutely part of the answer to that. Um, I, there's nothing like quite like practical experience uh, to teach and, and to educate folks about different ways of thinking about solving um, similar kinds of problems. I, I would ask I would ask Jeff if you want to add anything to that, but it seems to me that. Um, one of the things that's always been true when dealing with a lot of the issues around the pandemic is, in some cases, the rules about, um, about infection control and, um, and, um, and, and sort of facility management change based as the, as the science and the knowledge changes, and certainly around treatment, there's a lot that's changed since, uh, since this all began last, last spring. Um, but I certainly believe that having schools that are doing this and getting it done and districts that are doing it and getting it done creates a template uh, and a set of uh, thoughts and ideas and 
um, ways to think about it that makes it possible for other people to learn from that and to take advantage of it. I think the, um, I mean, we've said many times that the data is pretty clear on this, that um, kids are, uh, kids in schools um, are not where the vast majority of community transmission takes place. And the best example of all of that is probably the parochial school system, which has had almost 30,000 kids and 4,000 staff in person since the middle of August and has less than 40 cases, and none of which originated inside the school. Um, the department's own numbers show that with almost half a million kids and uh, staff and faculty uh, in either some form of hybrid or in-person uh, teaching, very small numbers with respect to um, infections, and none of which, for the most part, originated in the schools. And I, I think maybe one example of, a, of, a, of an in-school transmission, maybe not even... Small numbers. Yeah. Um, so I think the... For me, the, the big message here is, you know, the public health community, the pediatric community, a lot of the folks who spend their time thinking about children's health uh, have made very clear that um, if you follow the guidance and you create the rules and the processes and the, um, and the infection control mechanisms that are at this point are becoming more and more understood by more and more people in the space, your opportunity to do the right thing on behalf of kids um, is to find a way to get them into a classroom. I have a question about the surge. You know, we're closing in on some grim numbers, 10,000 potentially. Yesterday, we saw for the first time almost 2,500 cases. It seems as though we're reaching uncharted territory. We're nowhere near the uncharted territory we were at in the spring. Nowhere near it. Nowhere. Um, we are definitely dealing with a surge that we talked about throughout the summer and the beginning of the fall. and. Um, and we're currently the largest per capita tester in the United States. Um, we're doing somewhere between 80,000 and 100,000 tests a day. We were doing two or 3,000 tests back in March. Um, and our ability to identify cases is dramatically better now than it was back then. Um, as I said before, the healthcare system is far more prepared uh, to deal with and to manage these issues now than they were back in the spring. Um, we've been talking to them almost daily about uh, what the best way for us to support them as we go forward, and we'll have more to say about this tomorrow when we talk about some of the field hospitals uh, that we will reopen um, in places that will look relatively familiar, I think, to a lot of people. But this is a drill and a, and a process that I think at this point we have a fair amount of experience with. And, um, and I think in many ways um, this, is, uh, this is not just an issue for Massachusetts. It's a challenge for uh, for the rest of the country and frankly most of the Western world mm -hmm. and and there's a great story that just got posted That was in the Washington Post that talked about the fact that the vast majority of the spread that's currently going on at least in the US is dinner parties um, Game nights um, It's the it's the stuff. I've been talking about for months now small informal um, casual gatherings with a bigger circle of friends than people were spending time with back at the beginning of the summer. Um, and that is in many respects the thing that makes this uh, so insidious, which is for us to really win this fight, people have got to recognize and understand that spending a lot of time outside their core circle, their core social circle, their core family circle, um, if people aren't going to wear masks, aren't going to distance, aren't going to do the things that they do when they're in school or at work or they go to the store or they go almost anywhere else, um, your risk and your opportunity if you are infected to spread the virus is so much higher. And that's the piece that people really need to focus on. Can we give people some perspective when they see that sort of eye-popping number? Well, we hadn't seen that kind of number all summer long. We certainly hadn't seen it until yesterday. We currently have about 550 people in the hospital. We had 5,500 people in the hospital at the peak of this back in the spring. Ten times as many people. It's very different. And the, if you look at the slope of the line, and this is in the 
This is in the DPH data book that gets posted every day. The slope of the line with respect to hospitalizations went like this in the spring. The slope of that line now goes like this. Now, I've talked about the fact that it's moved since Labor Day, and that's the reason we put in the gathering limit, the stay-at-home advisory, and changed some of the rules with respect to um, outdoor and indoor activity. Um, but the big message that is critical in all this is familiar people being familiar in familiar settings is really, not just here, but all over the place, the major element that's driving the spread at this point. And people's social circles have gotten bigger. Um, take hockey, right? Youth hockey. The actual act of playing hockey, that may have been a minor contributor to what was going on, but the big issue there was all the socialization that was going on when large groups of kids and adults would show up at a rink at 7 o'clock in the morning, and there would be games all day long, and, you know, a kid would play in two or three games, and their parents would watch them in two or three games, and then the rest of the time was just a tremendous amount of informal, no mask, no distance socialization that went on between the kids and the adults, and that is where the vast majority of the issues associated with transmission came from. This is, this, this is the piece we really need to focus on. The, um, I think all of the states in the Northeast have basically agreed that it is the actual act of these big tournaments and all the stuff that goes on off the ice that's driving a big piece of the transmission um, around the region. And what we want to do basically is create a way, a set of rules, a set of policies, guidelines um, that everybody across the regions, because people are crossing state lines in this stuff on a pretty regular basis. We want everybody playing across the region with the same set of rules, the same set of protocols, the same set of guidelines that are all being enforced and administered the same way uh, in every state. And it's going to take us a few weeks to figure that out. So um, the first thing I say is that uh, we recognize there was a significant investment that needed to be made uh, by communities across the Commonwealth around almost all the issues associated with school and COVID. And, uh, and that was why um, we distributed almost a billion dollars to cities and towns in Massachusetts over the course of the summer, specifically to pay for and reimburse a lot of the stuff associated with school. Um, and I think in many ways, um, those resources have made it possible, not just for folks here, but folks in a lot of districts around Massachusetts, to create a, a safe environment for kids to come back. The other thing I would talk about is um, many of the special needs programs, which are oftentimes some of the more complicated to operate, um, are in person, have been in person all the way through the summer, and stayed in person all the way through the summer and through the fall, and that is close quarters in many cases, given the nature of some of the issues those kids are dealing with. Um, and there too, there's been really modest spread um, in transmission. And I, I keep coming back to this, the data is pretty clear. The real issue is, um, and there are a lot of resources in play as well, the real issue here is can people learn from those who've been successful and incorporate some of those learnings into the way they do it in their own environments so that we can all do what the docs and the pediatricians and the parents and so many others are saying, which is give kids the socialization and the in-person education, which is especially for the lower grades, so critical to their ability uh, to learn. How, Thanks, how, how, how have they not been able to um, <clears throat> the socialization that's happening outside of school? And my wife works at DC High, I know the kids all leave DC High and they go over do you know what goes on when they're not here? Oh, it, it's a challenge, right? It's a, it's a professional okay. challenge. Okay. Well, it is a challenge for us. Um, as students leave, they have a tendency to kind of fall back to some of their practices. But as I said, we, we work really closely with the, the parent community and the broader Carlisle community. So we have a local emergency planning committee, which uh, meets now 
once a week. We were meeting three times a week at the, at the height of the pandemic. But just to coordinate both in school and community public health issues and, you know, first responders, the chief Fisher is on there, chief Soros, our fire and police chiefs are there, public health, council on aging. So we bring everyone together. And when these items, these challenges percolate up, we take a, a community approach to resolving that and working with the parents. So they're still children, right? And even adults need some guidance. So we, we do that in a community way also. So it's a challenge, but we're working. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank and if I don't see you guys, hope you have a nice weekend. And we'll look forward to